Thank you so much. Please have a seat. question for you. What is keeping you from falling on the ground right now? Oh, you don't know? What, what is keeping you from going to flop right now? The chair. Thank you. Somebody's awake. What's keeping the chair from sinking into the ground beneath us? The foundation. What is the foundation made of? What would you guess? Concrete. It's a concrete pad. How often do you come in here and think, I wonder if the concrete pad's going to fall apart today? Huh? When was the last time you walked into this room and thought, I don't know, that concrete pad looks pretty shaky to me. We don't think about the concrete pad on which the floor sits, on which our chair sits, on which, which we sit. We don't talk about it. We don't think about it because we don't see it. We just assume that it's there. We depend upon it. In our physical world, in this room on Sunday morning, we depend on the concrete pad to which our chair sits. I would also like to make the point to you that there's a spiritual concrete pad that everything that we do in this room also depends upon. And that concrete pad is called faith. We don't see it. We rarely talk about it. But we depend on it. And every person in this room right now has a certain degree of faith. It may be 1% on a scale of 100, it may be 90% on a scale of 100. But everybody has some faith. And we're going to talk today about a verse from the Gospel of Luke. Scripture today is very easy, very short, very simple to understand. Jesus' apostles have something that they want to say to him. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. That's the command form of the, of the language. And Jesus said, if you had faith, like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and replant yourself in the sea, and it would be done. It would obey you. Now, understand that's a Jewish idiom. That means it is a saying that isn't literal, it's figurative. It means if you have a certain degree of faith, amazing things will happen. Not that you literally can tear up a tree by its roots and replant it in the ocean. Now, what I want to draw your attention to is the fact that the apostles put all the responsibility for gaining faith upon Jesus. It's Jesus' job to increase their faith. I think that's pertinent because I think a great many people come on church, to church on Sunday, and they say out loud or to themselves, consciously or subconsciously, okay, pastor, increase my faith. And I say to you, it isn't on me to increase your faith. It is on you to increase your faith. And this morning, I am going to give you a proven formula. Listen up. I am going to give you a proven formula for growing your faith or acquiring faith. If you have never had any faith, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, I am going to give you a means to acquire faith or grow the faith that you have. And I want you to understand, this is not something that I woke up on Tuesday and wrote down. What I'm about to teach you has been around for 17 centuries. And it is historically proven. It is true. If you want to grow your faith, if you want to acquire faith, do what I'm going to teach you to do. Now, I'm going to tell you in advance, it ain't easy. It's radical. But it will get you where you want to go. We're going to answer three questions. We're going to ask and answer three questions. What is faith? How does one acquire faith? And what do I do to grow faith? And I'd like to begin by asking somebody who wasn't in the first service to give me as generic and basic a definition of the word faith as you can outside of the church. I'll give you a context. All right? Here's an example. I have faith 
that the Cleveland Browns will play in the Super Bowl in 2020. Now, what did I just tell you? Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I have a hope. A hope. Come on. I have faith. All right? What else am I saying? Hope is right. Am I saying anything else when I say I have faith that the Cleveland Browns will play in the Super Bowl in 2020? What else am I saying? It's a belief. Huh? I believe it. I believe it. I have confidence. Now, I want to give you Webster's definition of faith. Because it's very important. Complete trust. Complete trust or confidence. That is to say, a firm belief, especially without logical proof. I have, I have complete trust, confidence, firm belief, especially without any logical proof, that the Cleveland Browns will play in the Super Bowl in 2020. Now, the only thread of logical proof I can offer is this. Before the Browns acquired Odell Beckham, Las Vegas had him as a 40-1 to 1 to play in the Super Bowl. After they acquired Odell Beckham, the odds dropped to 17-1. to 1. Now, that's logical proof, right? Except that we don't know what basis the betting line in Las Vegas made that decision. We're going to talk about faith this morning. What do you have complete trust in? or confidence in? What do you have the firm belief in? Especially without logical proof. An interesting point to be made as we begin our journey this morning is this fact. There's, there's a, a group of people called the General Society, General Social Society. The General Social Society. I have no idea who they are or what they do. But they've been taking a survey of American citizens since 1924. They have been asking citizens this question. Generally speaking, would you say that most people can be trusted? Or do you need to be careful when dealing with people? That's the question, survey question they've asked. In 1924, what percentage of people said yes to the question, would you say that most people can be trusted? I don't know how many thousands they surveyed. But of that, in 1924, what percentage of American citizens said yes to that question? What would you guess? 78%. 78% of American citizens in 1924 said, yes, I, I can trust people. When in 1972, they asked that question. You know what the percentage had fallen to? 46. They asked that question last year. You know what the percentage had fallen to? 21% of Americans say that most people can be trusted. Therefore, any pastor worth his salt recognizes that the people coming into the room on Sunday morning are going, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, gone. Yeah, for sure. Do you know what appears on every license plate in the state of Missouri? There's a slogan that appears on the license plates of all Missouri license plates. I said that, didn't I? What, you know what the slogan is? That's the show me state. That comes from a speech made by, let's see if I can find it real quick, Congressman Willard Van Diver, when somebody in 1899 on the, on the Senate floor made fun of his state, and I said, he says, quote, I come from a state that raises corn and cotton, cockle burrs and Democrats, and frothy eloquence neither convinces nor satisfies me. I'm from Missouri. You got to show me. Unquote. Americans come to everything with the attitude of show me. Show me the evidence. Show me the proof. Did President Trump collude with the Russians? Show me the proof. Did, is Joe Biden overly affectionate with people? Show me the proof. Did the Democrats steal the election from Bernie Sanders? Show me the proof. We want to see the proof before we believe anything. I want to give you proof this morning. I want to give you concrete proof that, listen up, I want to give you proof that God exists. I can prove it to you if you do what I'm going to teach you to do. And it's radical, and it's challenging, but it will prove to you, and it's not me saying it, it's been true for centuries. There is an underlying philosophy in America, <clears throat> this show me skepticism, 
And the underlying philosophy that's become a part of our culture and society actually traces itself to an essay written in 1877 by a Cambridge mathematician and philosopher named William Kingdon Clifford. Mr. Clifford wrote an essay that's remembered for the story that he uses to illustrate the point that he's making and for the conclusion that he comes to at the end of the essay. Now the story is of a shipmaker who realizes the life of the ship that he's about to send to sea is nearing the end. In fact, he is convinced the ship probably won't make it from New York to London, but he books it with passengers anyway. And he bumps up the insurance on it anyway. And he sends that, he tells everybody that he sells a ticket to, it's fine, it's good, it's solid, it's good, it's okay, sends them off and they don't even get 200 miles offshore and it goes down. And he collects the insurance money with a smile and goes on with his life. Now, Charles, uh, I'm sorry, William Clifford says that that's immoral, that that is he is guilty of killing those people. People, And the conclusion or the principle that Clifford makes as a result of this story, and this has become part of who we are, quote, it is wrong always, everywhere, for anyone to believe anything without sufficient evidence. This is an underlying principle in American culture. It is wrong always, everywhere, for anyone to believe anything on insufficient evidence. But then Mr. Clifford goes on and offers this thought. He says, it is acceptable to believe when somebody tells you when there is a reasonable grounds for supposing that he knows the matter on which he speaks. It's okay to believe somebody if you think that they are an expert in what they are talking about, if they evidence that they know what they're talking about. I've been a believer since I was 14. At 35 years after I became a believer, God called me into ministry. I spent nine years getting a master's degree and a doctorate degree. I have been preaching and serving as a pastor for 20 years. And I'm standing here putting my credentials on the floor, not to impress you, but to make this point. When I tell you that you can grow your faith or acquire your faith if you will do what I'm teaching you this morning. I am telling you the truth. I am staking my reputation on this truth. If you will do what I'm teaching you to do, you will grow or acquire your faith. And it's not me. It's not just me. It's been true for 1,700 years. So the first question is, what is faith? It is having the complete confidence in something, whether there's logical proof or not. The second question is, how do we acquire faith? And the answer is through knowledge and personal experience. And the third question is, how do I grow my faith? And the answer is, follow this formula. Now I want to draw a line in the sand between faith as we use it in secular language and faith as used in the Bible. I'm going to read you three real quick short passages. The Greek word is pistis, which I just love to say. The word is pistis, which translates to faith. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. That pretty much follows Webster's definition. So, faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ, meaning the preached gospel. And finally, without faith, it is impossible to please God, for whoever would draw near to God must first believe that he exists. And then here's the key phrase that I want you to remember. He rewards those who seek Him. He rewards those who seek Him. And I'm going to give you a formula to use to seek Him. Is there another one? No, that's it. <clears throat> How does one grow one's faith? All right. The, this principle comes from the life of Jesus Christ. So we're going to start by asking the silly question. How long, how old was Jesus when he died? Anybody know that? 33. <clears throat> how long was his public ministry? Three years. What did he do the other 30? Pretty much whatever he wanted to. When he was a kid, he did what mom and dad told him to do, what society told him to do, what his religion told him to do. And then... He dedicated 10% of his life to God 
and he dedicated 90% of his life to his personal pursuits. It is from this fact and a whole bunch of other things that we get a principle that's known as the 90-10 principle. And this is the key to what I'm teaching. And again, it's not me. I'm just repeating what's already been laid out in Christian history. If we live our lives based on the 90-10 principle, we will acquire faith or grow the faith that we have. Now, it's not easy to live the 90-10 principle, but if we do, we will grow our faith. It is a proven, it is a proven fact of history. If you live your life on 90-10, you will grow your faith. It is as straightforward and as simple as I can make it. What does that mean? 90% of your time, 90% of your life, you can do whatever you want to do. 90% of your income, you can spend it any way you want to. 90% of the talents and the skills and, and the abilities that you have, you can use them any way you want to. But 10% of that belongs to God. 10% of your life, 10% of your talents, 10% of your income belongs to God. Now think about this. Where did you get life at? Where did your life come from? What did you do to be born? We didn't do anything to be born. Why are you born and quadrillions of others never born? Dumb luck, perverse universe, cosmic accident, or by design. I have the theory that God gave us life. If God gave us all of this to begin with, and he only asked for 10% back, doesn't that seem reasonable? He says, 90% of what you do, do what you want to do. Perfectly okay. I'd like you to live a life that glorifies me, but whatever. 10%, do whatever you want to. I mean 90%. 90% of your income, spend it any way you want to. But 10% belongs to me. If you sleep eight hours a night, you have 119 hours every week that are waking hours that you can do something. That you can do something. If you follow the 90-10 principle, that means 11.9 hours every week goes back to God. Oh, that's unreasonable. I, got, I, got two, I can't do that. That'll be 45 minutes every morning and 45 minutes every night, seven days a week. That is unreasonable. Well, in a sense, it is. But Jesus teaches sacrificial living. He teaches us sacrificial living. That is the essence of what it means to be a follower. Can I have that passage from Romans now? I never can find it in my script. <clears throat> Therefore, I urge you, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. A sacrifice. A sacrifice isn't easy. It's, it's expensive. It's hard. I want you to present your life, your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is and what is good and acceptable and perfect. The 90-10 principle is living life sacrificially. And your first response, everybody's first response is, that's impossible. And you are absolutely right. It's impossible. From man's standpoint, from our first blush standpoint, that's impossible. Where am I going to find 11.9 hours that I don't have spending? I have, I've just got so much on my plate now. How can you ask me to give up 11.9 hours every week? Well, here's the reality. The reality is, if you give that time to God, suddenly your day is going to get longer. Because you are going to be more productive. Because you are going to be more at peace. And you are going to have more confidence and more joy and more, more focus than you've ever had before. I'm not making up some malarkey to try to convince you of something. I am teaching you historical truths. People who do this accomplish an enormous amount in the course of a day. Do you know how much time you and I waste? I, I just read this this week, and this blows my mind. There's a guy named Terry Niehoff who's a, a blogger to Christian to pastors, and I read him every day. And he's made a study of people who are successful, highly successful men. And one of the things he came upon across the board of successful people that blew his mind, they wear the same thing every day. Do you know why? Because they have learned that you have X number of ounces of creative energy 
every day. And they don't want to spill any of that trying to decide, do I wear a red shirt with the blue pants or do I wear a white shirt with the brown socks? And that takes creative energy to choose what to wear. So they wear the same thing every day. So they waste no creative energy. They eat the same meal for breakfast every day. Why? So they don't have to make a decision. They take the same route to work every day. Because we waste a lot of time. God says, if you will give me 10% of your time, 10% of your income, and 10% of your talents, I will grow your faith. Now, how does that work, Pastor? Well, you're sitting there saying, I can't give up 10% of my income. I can barely make ends meet right now. I agree. But tithe and watch what happens. And by the way, for the record, I don't want your money. I don't want your time. I don't want your talent. I'm not, I'm not chilling for this church or for my ministry. I am trying to give you something. I am desperately trying to give you something that will lead you into the most glorious kind of life you could possibly have. Tithe your income, tithe your time, tithe your talents, and watch what happens. Because Scripture promises and history proves no matter how much you give away, God will replace it at a higher level than what you gave away of your time, of your talent, of your money. After I preached this sermon this morning, I had a gentleman come to me and said, four weeks ago, you said something that really touched my heart, and I decided to tithe as a result. He said, I'm working at a new job. I've been working there several months, and nobody even knows my name. He said, the Monday after I gave the first tithe, my supervisor came by and says, You're, my boss wants to see you. He didn't have any idea who this man was. He's the boss of the whole thing. And he calls him up and he says, I, I know who you are. I know what you've been doing. We want to take further use of your abilities. We're going to cross-train you to do this, this, and this. He says, I've done He's been tithing four weeks. And he swore he couldn't make ends meet if he did it. And he says, I have more income to spend now, and I don't know why. I don't know what I've done. It's a true story. No matter where you think you are, and you, you think you cannot give 10%, if you give the 10%, I promise you, God will put it back more than what you took out. And it's the same thing of your time and the same thing of your talents. The Bible is filled with testimony of people who lived a radical life and God blessed it. And that's what He is teaching us to do today. What could we do in the city of Rushville if 10 people became 90-10 livers? What could we do in our community if 20 people became 90-10 livers and gave away 90% of their time and their talent for God? What could we do if 100 people began living the 90-10 principle? You want to acquire faith? Live life following the 90-10 principle. Do you want to grow your faith? Live life following the 90-10 principle. You want to know whether God exists or not? Live your life following the 90-10 principle. And I promise you, God will show up. And I don't use the word promise lightly. I want to close with a true story. It's the greatest sermon illustration I've ever encountered. I may have shared this with you before. I know the hour was late, but listen, this will take just a moment. The hour was 1860 to see as Niagara Falls. <clears throat> there was a famous tightrope walker named Blondin. He began running ads in the local newspapers saying that he was going to string a wire across the Niagara Falls, right at the point where the falls goes down to the rocks. And he was charging 10 cents for people to come and watch him walk a tightrope a thousand feet across the river. 10 cents in 1860 is a lot of money, by the way. On the day of the event, they came, thousands of people came, and there was, in fact, a tightrope strung across the river. There was Blondin with his 20-foot rope. He was talking through a microphone, or a megaphone, actually, sorry, and he was telling people what he was going to do. He was asking people if they thought he could walk a 1,000 feet across a tightrope with all that mist, slick in the water, could he walk across that tightrope without falling? And the vast majority of people said, no, we came to watch you fall. And he got up on the wire with his pole, 
and he walked a thousand feet from America to Canada, and he turned around and walked back. And a lot of people applauded. They were blown away. He said, do you think I can do it again? And a, a few people said, oh, maybe, you know, and he did it again. And he did it three or four times. Then he comes back to the American side and he says, how many people think I could walk across that tightrope pushing a wheelbarrow? And they're like, no, no chance. Nope. People begin taking bets as to how far he'd get before he'd fall off. But his assistants put a wheelbarrow up on the tightrope. He took his pole, attached it where he could hold on to the, the pole and the, and the wheelbarrow, and he walked a thousand feet across the Niagara Falls on a tightrope pushing a wheelbarrow. And he did it three times. When he came back the third time, he got down, he got on the megaphone, and he said, how many people think I can push a wheelbarrow with 200 pounds of sand in it across that tightrope? And despite all they'd seen, the majority of people said, nope. And his assistants filled the wheelbarrow with bags of 200 pounds of sand, and he walked back and forth across that tightrope three times. When he came back to the American side, and they were cheering, they were going nuts, they were screaming, they were amazed. He said, how many people think I can put a human being in that wheelbarrow and take him across to Canada? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, all right, who wants to do it? Who's willing to get in the wheelbarrow? Not a single person volunteered. Because while they had intellectual conviction, they didn't have conviction of the heart. They refused to get in the wheelbarrow. And because they didn't get in the wheelbarrow, they didn't experience something amazing. You understand the point? I'm inviting you to get into Jesus Christ's wheelbarrow, and I'm telling you, I'm guaranteeing you, despite human logic that says it's impossible to give up 11.9 hours every week for God, if you do it, He'll replace it. Despite your logic that says, I cannot give up 10% of my income, if you give it up, He'll replace it and more. And despite our human logic that says, I cannot afford to give my talents to anything other than making money for myself. If you give your talents and your abilities and your skills 10% to God, He will bless you. And here's where the, where the growing of the faith comes in. It's impossible. We know that's impossible. Our minds say that's impossible. Our experience says that's impossible. And yet when we do it, it becomes possible. And when it becomes possible, even though we know it's impossible, all of a sudden we start hearing God. I can testify, I can, I can give you the names of 50 people who, on whom America's industry is founded. J.C. Penney's, uh, uh, I can't think of any others right now, but there's 50 or 60 of them who follow this principle their entire life and become multimillionaires, gave away billions of dollars and died with billions in their possession. It's not Pastor Dave teaching some harebrained idea he thought up on Tuesday. It is a 1,700 year proven principle. Who's willing to get into the wheelbarrow? That's power heads. Holy Father, I've done everything you asked me to do, and now I can't do any more. And so I turn it over to you. I pray, Holy Father, that your spirit will speak to the minds and hearts that are closed in this room that I cannot let go of their human logic and their human experience, which says this isn't possible. I beg you to do everything that you can to break through that ignorance and that certainty and lead them to faith, to believe that if they follow the 90-10 principle, it will change everything. It will give them peace. It will bring them joy. It will bring them a life of comfort. It will bring them a life of confidence. They can face death a smile on their face and joy in their heart because they know they belong to you and are going to pass through the curtain of time into your arms. It is the best life possible. Would you teach them that, Father? Would you plant that deep into their hearts where they walk out of here and make a promise to you to live following the 90-10 principle? Thank you so much for giving me these inspiring words to say. May they have their intended goal. These things I ask in the blessed name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to ask one more time if I could have four or five volunteers to set up tables in the next room. I would appreciate that very much. Go in peace. Honor the Lord with the time you have left.